Okay, so time for another uh, weird version of me, Wizard of Oz, narrating these PowerPoints. Uh, because of the situation and the way things are going, I've taken the liberty of um, amalgamating the last two presentations into one, kind of streamline it. And we're gonna talk about global climate change and conservation together, okay? So, I don't know if you've ever seen this movie, I've mentioned it multiple times in the classes that I teach. This is Fern Gully, old school 90s Disney movie about saving the rainforest. Really, really cool stuff. Um, probably one of the top five reasons that I went on to become a biologist. Now, just to maintain some relevancy, like I've been trying to do because it seems so strange to just ignore it and keep on teaching like we're not in the midst of a global pandemic. Um, seems like things might be looking up, right? We did some modeling for uh, population growth, about case number. Of course, a lot of you reached out to me and asked me some questions like, well, uh, if, you know, the carrying capacity is the entire U.S. population, then... You know, why don't we see that? Well, because everybody's locked in their houses. Um, people are undergoing minimal traffic. And of course, uh, mostly because we don't have the testing to even have an idea what that actual um, case number has been. We, we try to make estimations. And of course, we didn't even talk about mortality, which is something we'll get into modeling in actually an ecology lecture. First, let's talk about uh, environmental impact. This is something that we've been seeing in the news about coronavirus, and we've seen this, so oh, the dolphins are in the Venice Canal. Uh, animals are starting to come back. Um, this isn't true. This isn't true at all. It's actually completely false, um, as far as I've been able to find when I dig into this. I saw a really funny meme. It was like, uh, this is Central Park right now, and it had all the dinosaurs from the original Jurassic Park movie there, which is kind of just making fun, I guess, of everybody's reaction to the environmental benefit of a global pandemic. Which, you know, not to say, I've looked up the numbers, and it seems like NASA estimations on carbon reduction as a result of decreased traffic is somewhere in the, the realm of two-thirds the amount of... Uh, what it would take for us to uh, stagnate or minimize our typical one and a half degree temperature climb on average, if you factor in oscillations over the last decade or so forth. Um, there are some benefits, for sure, less traffic. However, um, something that's interesting I was able to find is that the EPA is reducing, they're increasing lenience, leniency on uh, carbon output regulations in the midst of the pandemic in an effort to somehow minimize economic impact on fossil fuel companies and so forth. So whatever gain that we are probably uh, seeing as a result of decreased traffic and activity will probably surely be offset in the near future uh, as as regulations on fossil fuel companies and large-scale corporations is uh, is looser in the midst of the pandemic. So in other words, certain companies have to follow a lot of strict guidelines on their carbon out output and a lot of them have to offset depending on what they're doing and where they're developing and so forth. And a lot of that will probably be um, excused in the midst of this, and so we'll probably see some serious offsetting as a result of this. We'll talk about some positive things that have happened, uh, but as a general rule of thumb, nothing uh, significant or long lasting as a result of this, unfortunately, okay? So we're gonna talk about energy in general, how energy moves through an ecosystem, and we'll focus specifically on carbon and nitrogen, carbon and nitrogen cycles, because they greatly impact our overall environments. Um, and of course we impact our environments directly through our activity. Okay. Now, when we talk about energy input and output, all the energy, our primary energy source, of course, is the solar radiation from the sun, uh, which is then, um, basically all the energy that the sun's throwing at us, very little of it actually gets used by us. 
uh, most of the plant cover, the herbaceous cover on the planet, um, and the algae in the ocean essentially attempts to utilize about a 1% of uh, that total solar radiation that's being output. And this is termed what we call net primary productivity. Um, most of that's going to the sun. Uh, a lot of it's lost more than half of the energy that the plants absorb um, is lost as, as heat just because the reactions that are involved in photosynthesis are not perfect. Um, no living thing is, obviously. But we're gonna talk about primary productivity and how energy is used in ecological uh, chains. And a lot of this gets back to what you guys know from previous classes and so forth about consumers. We know that, of course, plants are the primary producers and algae and so forth in aquatic environments. And, of course, we've got insects in that next trophic level that are usually relying upon something that's in the leaf litter or detritus in the soil. And then, of course, we've got other insects or even larger ones that are eating those insects and so forth. And then, of course, we've got animals that are eating those insects and worms that are in the leaf detritus in the soil. And then, of course, other creatures that eat them. <laughs> we have hawks right here. Hawks eat birds all the time. Y'all, right now, it's really common and it's becoming increasingly pop popular for people to keep chickens. My neighbors have chickens. Um, or they've got a couple left. One of the things that you need to keep in mind for you keep chickens, hawks eat them. Cooper's hawks, really common hawk around here. Hawks eat chickens all the time. One of the main reasons you keep a male rooster is because they're brutally mean. They will spur you though. They'll hit you with their, uh, their little talons and uh, poke holes in your legs and try to chase you. Roosters are mean, y'all, if, uh, if you've never had one. What's hilarious <laughs> about Bermuda is that people like equate Bermuda with tropical paradise and um, there's feral chickens everywhere. And in fact, they live together in wild populations with cats and together they are mean, mean uh, feral cat chicken populations that just roam the island and kind of run it. It's kind of hilarious. But hawks will eat your chickens, um, barred owls will eat your chickens, foxes will eat your chickens, raccoons will eat your chickens. Um, and barred owls will actually eat hawks and uh, anything else they can get a hold of, which is crazy. Now, obviously, trophic levels are not directly linear. They're interconnected amongst all of these different creatures as each one of them consumes more than one particular thing, right? Okay. Usually we don't see anything above quaternary consumer, and this has to do with the fact that by the time, uh, this has to do with that trophic cascade of energy reduction, and by the time you get to a tertiary consumer, there's very little energy uh, to consume left in their body. Not literally, but energy available in that trophic cascade for that particular um, individual. So in other words, Anything above here is, is not usually going to be supported because there's just not a, a, a high enough number of them in a particular environment, which is why we don't see a lot of things running around hunting hawks and foxes. Though, like I mentioned before, bar barred owls will do it. Typically, they're just consumer considered also quaternary consumers. Uh, and in fact, when we have wild wolf populations, sometimes they'll consume foxes, but not too often do we find something above quaternary uh, consumers. And that's because of this efficiency of energy transfer, right? We have most of the energy production in terms of biomass being produced by the primary pr producers, of course, all of it. And then um, we have this drastic 10%, only about 10% is, is is transferred in tons in terms of biomass. In other words, like I said, there's just not enough creatures by the time you get to tertiary consumers to have quaternary um, predators uh, prolific in number or regularly seen in most environments. Now, sometimes in some areas, you will certainly have a, a great number of quaternary consumers, but it has to be a highly productive ecosystem. Of course, you guys can't answer questions. Wah, wah. Um, 
Oh, here's an example of the diversity of one particular group of creatures here at birds. We see high diversity around those equatorial regions. And of course, this has to do getting all the way back to the fact that we have the high increase and in most of our biomass in terms of primary producers are, is in equatorial regions. We see this in tropical wet forests. We have net primary productivity. Um, and then we can see productivity is extremely high in coral reefs and algal beds as well, even though they make up a very, very small percentage of the planet, um, unfortunately, because they are such productive habitats, right? Although tropical wet forests, um, and of course, if you're familiar with the mountains of North Carolina, with, that is a temperate rainforest, if you've ever heard of that before, because the rain level is extremely high. Um, we also have a great degree of gradation and elevation change, and as a result of that, we see a crazy high level of biodiversity. The Great Smoky Mountain National Park, y'all, has a greater number of plant species than any other national park in the U.S., which is awesome. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that the Appalachians uh, have been around for about a billion years. Now, this productivity or these trophic levels in relation to productivity also relate directly to biomagnification, which is a concept I'm sure you've learned before, because as we go up in each level of the trophic cascade, so increases um, the concentrations of toxic pollutants, things like DDT, which is a really common pesticide we've learned all about before, right? The, the campaigns, the advertising campaigns in the 50s and 60s were just crazy. And the fact that kids used to just play in DDT dust and now we wonder why all of our family members have significant health issues, right? They're like, things were better back when we were young. Like, y'all used to just run through DDT, you know? Shush, Grandma. So, biomagnification is this increase in concentration as we go up in each level of this, of this trophic cascade. Since there's this drastic reduction in biomass, there's an increase in concentration of these other toxic pollutants and heavy metals and so forth, not just DDT, but just a really common example. So, what else we got? Oh, we see this with mercury concentration in, um, in trophic cascades in the ocean, of course, we've got filter feeders absorbing a small amount of mercury as mercury has leached into our uh, oceans through production and manufacturing. The same is true, of course, of radioactive cesium and so forth, like we see in nuclear power plants like Fukushima, which is why, y'all, you can get a hold of Atlantic fish, Atlantic fish, and there's radioactive cesium from the Fukushima plant, which is in an ocean on the other side of the planet which is crazy, but you can see by the time you get to tuna, you've got such a high concentration of toxic or heavy metals, and the same goes for radioactive cesium now. And I made this joke before, like if you're eating, if fish is healthy, it has a high concentration of um, omega-3 fatty acids, which are extremely useful um, and function somewhere in antioxidants. But the, the issue is, is that you're also consuming heavy toxic metals. Um, salmon, or in the South, salmon, uh, as they say, wild Alaskan salmon is probably some of the um, cleanest fish you can get. But then again, you're stripping an ecosystem that harvests wild Alaskan salmon. You'll find that everything we talk about in the in in sustainability and conservation is basically a double-edged sword. And anyone who kind of sells it like it's not really doesn't have a good understanding of it in general. Okay, so if we look at the global carbon cycle. Of course, we see huge reservoirs for carbon, carbon sinks, that are sucking up huge amounts of carbon. We see this in mountains and soil and trees and so forth. We know that trees are made up of links of carbon and soil is, is the same, which is why tilling the soil isn't ideal uh, because it re-releases carbon that's been sequestered into it. And in fact, you'll see kind of a new movement in gardening and farming and so forth called permaculture practice. A lot of it's just rooted in agroecology. Permaculture is kind of like pseudoscience-y, and a lot of scientists um, are not a big fan of it. But in general, 
they have a lot of beneficial practices like no-till gardening and, and that's to sequester or maximize the sequestration of carbon. So, mountains, soil, ocean, this is all huge carbon sinks. And of course, we're the problem with us is that we're using up our land, uh, <laughs> we're lighting stuff on fire that we dig out of big holes in the ground. Um, our agriculture, of course, is disastrous in terms of carbon output because it takes so much energy and literally the increase in number of those creatures um, causes increased respiration. And as a result of that, the photosynthesis can't keep up, right? Especially not as we're lo losing large tracts of forest elsewhere. Big key to think about is uh, trees are only maximizing their sequestration of carbon while they're growing. Big old ones are storing huge amounts of carbon, but as soon sure as they're cut down and if they're lit on fire, um, then we re-release that CO2 into the atmosphere, okay? Of course, we're, as I mentioned before, we're increasing this <laughs> sequestered CO2 that's been buried in holes on the planet by digging it up and lighting it on fire. Y'all, I, oh man, Joe could talk way more about this, but Joe, right? Our um, PA for the class is headed to vet veterinary school, <laughs> hopefully in the fall. Um, Joe worked on an oil rig for forever and he used to help drill um, those giant holes I never realized this. I thought maybe they're a couple hundred feet down. Y'all, they're like five miles holes into the ocean is where we tap into fossil fuels. Yeah, we're digging five mile long deep holes into the ocean to try and suck out these fossil fuels. And that's just to fuel all of the things that we do, right? All the things that we do to make this computer work and this phone function, everything dependent upon energy output, right? So you always see this CO2 concentration increases in some abstract chart somewhere over the years and how it's increasing over time, right? One thing that's important to, to notice is that we have these increase in oscillations where we have this slight decrease in CO2 concentration throughout the year. And that has to do with seasonality and winter time in the Northern Hemisphere because there's a drastic decrease in photosynthetic activity during that time. Pretty interesting. Rise, yeah, yeah. So you see that increase in CO2 is less of it's being taken in by plants during the winter time. Hopefully you're well familiar with the greenhouse gas effect, right? We have solar radiation coming in. Um, cloud cover typically limits that irradiation or the return of that radiation as infrared in the form of infrared back out to outer space. The problem, of course, is that all those things that we dig up out of the ground and light on fire thicken this layer of greenhouse gases that's trapped in our atmosphere that then re-radiates that heat back towards the planet. And that's how we're overall heating up the planet over time, right? All the things that we've talked about already. Um, we, of course, are using a lot of interesting uh, sampling techniques to analyze what carbon's been for a very, very long time. A lot of people are always like, well, how do we know what the CO2 level was that long ago? Well, we can dig up ice cores, you guys, from half a million years ago and literally um, measure the amount of CO2 that was in the atmosphere at that time which is pretty crazy. And you can see that we have these natural oscillations over time, and you'll hear this common argument, right? Well, the Earth, of course, it, it, there's a large degree in temperature fluctuation, and that's true, y'all. Um, if we go back in the, on the geologic time scale really far, we've had hot times before, many hot times, right? We've had ice ages and melting of the ice ages and so forth. But we have significant changes, right? We had basically a consistent and constant level of CO2 in the atmosphere for the last almost million years until in the 50s when we see this gross increase or significant exponential increase in production and CO2 output, then we have crazy high levels of CO2 like we have never seen before. A lot of those CO2 levels we've seen are, are absorbed by forests, but some of them are absorbed by the ocean and sequestered through algal activity and so forth. Um, is this good or bad for biodiversity? Of course, 
If you remember your carbonic acid cycle in your bloodstream that regulates blood, blood pH, then you can kind of make that logical jump to the CO2 cycle. Uh, since CO2 mixes with water, becomes carbonic acid, and leads to the acidification of the ocean, the problem is that, is that these zooxanthellae, or the symbiotic little creatures that live in coral, which is an animal, not a plant, even though it looks like a plant. Um, my daughter knows a lot of really smart things. This thing she cannot get through her head. Uh, in any case, we've got these little symbiotic creatures that live in the coral structures and they uh, essentially exchange nutrients uh, in response for a nice uh, cool apartment in the form of coral. They get to have that structure that they live in. But the problem is that ocean acidification leads, leads to coral bleaching and coral bleaching is obviously not good because this is essentially the forest of the ocean where a ton of carbon sequestration happens and um, coral bleaching is disastrous. What's really interesting y'all is from a personal standpoint, Growing up in Bermuda, we used to see these purple sea fans, which are these beautiful pieces of coral all over super close to shore. And as I've gotten older, less and less and less of them. So that's just anecdotal, but still really interesting as something that I've personally experienced as I've witnessed coral bleaching over time. Uh, you can still see purple sea fans, and in fact, some of them have tried to reestablish, but you've got to go out further than you than you used to, and there's a drastic number of them um it, overall in general a lot of it comes from tourists stealing them punks uh so you could look at a lot of different things when we examine uh climate change over time one of them is the movement of trees and if i believe i've mentioned this before either in 2120 or 2130 but the reason sorry i'm shaking the desk and then shaking the phone the reason that we have such colorful falls here is as a result of the um, movement of ice sheets over thousands of years. And that slow movement has allowed the establishment of a wide range of trees. But we also see this northern migration of certain um, cold tolerant and cold preferential trees towards more northern latitudes. Uh, over time as it gets warmer and warmer at lower and lower or warmer and warmer at higher and higher elevations and their only ability to survive like we see in jack pines um, is at extremely high elevations. Of course, Mount Mitchell here in North Carolina only goes up to about 6,000 feet and we have Fraser fir uh, and red spruce forests. Uh, I'm sorry, balsam fir and uh, red spruce forests and Fraser fir forests are, oh man, they're on the drastic decline, largely because uh, firs are super susceptible to um, the balsam woolly adelgid, which is a little nasty insect that, that feeds on these trees that are compromised because of their increased exposure to heat and solar radiation as a result of um, global climate change. So, we said before, climates have changed as much or maybe more in the past. Why are we worried? Well, because we have this rapid change in climate that we have not seen before. It's not unprecedented that we have had these temperatures. It's not unprecedented that we've had these changes. The rate at which these things are occurring is unprecedented. And there's a million different ways you can get all these kinds of data um, and this is why it gets really tricky when you start debating these types of things with people. But one of the things that it's easy to, to kind of demonstrate is this rapid change. And of course, this has to do with the fact that we're experiencing exponential population growth, um, right now, or we have been, um, and as a result of that, we have this increase in CO2 emissions at a, at a rate that's, that's been unmatched, okay? What types of organisms will likely fare better than others? Well, of course, this is a cute little, cute little um, lagomorph. This is a, uh, <laughs> this is a pika or a pika. This is what inspired Pikachu, y'all. But it's just a little rodent. They live at high altitudes. 
um, and rock outcrops. So what's interesting is that the more niche specific, and of course the uh, rarer that niche, the more susceptible that specific creature is to change within that niche, or niche if you want to sound super elitist. Um, generalists will fare better, uh, especially when they're in areas that have wider range habitats where more of it can change, right? Like grassland and so forth. Uh, when you get up to spruce fir forests, like we see up towards Mount Mitchell and on the parkway in North Carolina, you see this uh, drastic quick shift in these creatures. We have some rare flying squirrels that live up there in North Carolina, uh, struggling to survive with changes to their um, sensitive environment. We've also got changing in the cues of flowering and migratory patterns and stuff. And this might not seem like a big deal. What's really interesting, just in the garden, for me, I can see things bloom earlier and earlier, which is really, really, um, obviously when you really love flowers, <laughs> you, you tend to get excited, but then you remember why they're happening and you get less so. Uh, because if we have cues where we have pollinators not ready to pollinate, but flowers blooming, well, then that can lead to destruction for that particular plant species. Migration patterns also has to do with um, fledgling and feeding of birds and so forth, and this can be disaster, right? So in the early 80s, for example, you've got this maximizing of the biomass of caterpillars when caterpillars are essentially populations are at their highest, and we've got the date of hatching a little bit before that, so little baby birds can get all the caterpillars that they need to survive. This is a gross oversimplification, but a brilliant example on how we need timing to line up and how climate change can drastically affect these things, okay? Now, if we look at today, where we have this hatching of caterpillar larva early, then what ends up happening is this peak in biomass for, their, for, for a primary food source for most little baby birds it doesn't line up when those hatchlings need to be fed. And so there's this disparity in food availability that can lead to the destru destruction of certain uh, bird populations. This silly little bird up here um, looks like a Carolina chickadee. If you take field, you go with me, we'll learn all about them. They make a little call that goes chickadee dee 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 dee. I can do so many bird sounds, y'all. <laughs> y'all know the ice caps are melting. Yes, we've got uh, decrease in ice mass. What's really interesting though is you have this decrease in um, Arctic ice. You have this uh, land mass. You, you, we see, however, though, because of the way um, ocean currents work and so forth, we have an increase in ice deposition in the Antarctic land mass going on uh, concurrently, which is interesting phenomenon to try and figure out. But this melting, of course, leads to the destruction of quaternary predators like polar bears, and of course we've seen all the sad films. Um, and these guys are important mostly because they're a flagship species, you guys. There's a ton of creatures that live in these environments that are super, super rare that we don't um, hear about or learn about, and that's because they don't really pull on your heartstrings as much. People don't really care about saving a landmass. What they sa care about saving is uh, cute little bears, even though if you, uh, if you follow anything on the internet, you know, these cute little bears are some of the most brutal creatures on the planet. So we have some general understanding about carbon inputs and outputs. We know we're burning fossil fuels. We're lighting things on fire. Uh, we know we're using land, uh, for agriculture and this increased use of, uh, land for agriculture has led to further increase CO2 output. We know the land's trying and the ocean's trying to take in some of these things as carbon sinks. However, uh, having a hard time keeping up. One thing I wanna po point out though is math. That So people make arguments all the time about carbon sequestration and sustainability and so forth, but I wanna run y'all through the numbers, not to uninspire you, just to show you how uh, ridiculous some of the pressure coming from sustainability efforts is. Uh, and we'll talk about what's more realistic to look at, okay? So just how realistic is it for you to make daily adjustments to impact CO2 output um, on the large scale? 
Let me run y'all through some actual math because nobody ever does this, okay? So, a gallon of gas releases about 20 pounds of CO2. A couple pounds of a tree soaks up about know, six pounds of CO2, okay? It's a weird way to think about it, but basically, you know, the trees are taking up that CO2 and we're releasing it, okay? Forget the numbers if you if you don't want to try and hold on to this, okay? I, I did a metric just because it's a little easier to keep track of. Um, maybe, maybe not. So, you would need about 12 pounds of tree per gallon of gasoline you use. 12 pounds, 12 pounds of wood, right? Uh, so like, you know, a big limb, all right? So General Sherman, which is an enormous sequoia in Sequoia National Park, weighs about a million kilograms. It's the largest tree in the world. In the US, people use about 400 million gallons of gas a day. So to counterbalance that, we would need to grow 17, 1,780 General Shermans every day, okay? Now, there are about 8,000 giant sequoias in Sequoia National Park, and most of them are, um, all of them, are smaller than General Sherman. So every week, we would need to grow another one and a half sequoia national parks, okay? Every week to set off a day's worth of gas usage, just gas, okay? Now, what's the problem? General Sherman's a couple thousand years old, right? It's General Sherman. Y'all, if you've never been to the West Coast to see the giant redwoods and sequoias, it's it's a, it's got to be on your bucket list. Got to be. Okay, so Sequoia National Park's about 400,000 acres. So we're going to grow one Sequoia National Park a week. But if we step out of California, because uh, California actually, incidentally, is high in biodiversity and biomass in general. We've got a lot of national parks there especially if we go all the way up the West Coast and get into Washington. It's also like that. Um, and Northern California. Let's step next door to Nevada. It's funny, in North Carolina, they say Nevada. But uh, in FCCLA in high school, we met some people from Nevada. And the only thing that they wanted us to remember was that it was pronounced Nevada. <laughs> okay, so to keep up with USA gasoline consumption, you would need to grow one Nevada of Sequoia National Park every couple of years, okay? You would need to fill up a whole state with Sequoia National Park, which are trees that take thousands of years to grow every two years, okay? So in other words, since Obama was first elected, going all the way back to the last election, right? I'm about to have another one. You would need to have covered all of Texas, Oklahoma, Arkansas, and Arizona with Sequoia National Park without removing any of the current trees that are there, to offset human consumption in the gas in the U.S. from gasoline alone, and this isn't counting diesel. This isn't coal. This isn't natural gas, right? This isn't airplanes flying through the air. This isn't fuel that's used to ship giant ships from China to here with our eBay products, right? That is the that's the cold hard truth of trying to run some magic numbers to investigate what it would be like to try and attempt to offset carbon, right? It's insane, you guys. It's impossible. Now, does it mean we shouldn't involve ourselves with some conservation efforts? No, but it definitely means we have to think about these things in another way, all right? It's the only way to remain carbon neutral. Well, you could buy your own land, grow potatoes, fertilize them with your poop, never leave, only eat those potatoes. But the real answer is that we need innovative technology, right? We need about 100 Elon Musks. We all need Teslas, which means we all need money, right? Talk about electric vehicle purchasing y'all can you imagine how much that's going to decrease as a result of economic damage from this pandemic let alone looser fossil fuel regulations ain't nobody gonna be buying teslas this year you know maybe a few people so we need new technology in terms of carbon offset that doesn't mean conservation efforts are wasted it means they have to be focused in a different way 
So, in the last 500 years, we've had uh, 76 mammal species become extinct. I think since I did this PowerPoint, it's like 79. Um, we've got about 5,500 mammals total. All, a couple hundred of them are critically endangered. Uh, 30 of those, we don't even know if they're still in nature or not. And of course, we're for for a good chunk of this, we don't have enough data to make proper analysis. Okay, so we've always used mammals. I y'all, I focus on mammals by the way because these are these flagship species that elicit uh, these uh, the feels, right? And we need the feels. <laughs> I'm bouncing that camera around. Sorry, y'all. We need the feels uh, to feel motivated to to conserve right we obviously have pets but we've used animals as, uh for work of course we've used their skins and furs now we use them for genetic engineering and medical research and of course still for hunting and wildlife management which by the way um as far as money goes y'all hunting 99 percent of conservation efforts um, in terms of economic input, come from hunters. So every time you see these people online arguing over Keurig cups, right, or not to do this or that to this particular species of animal, keep in mind that if you really want to be involved in the conservation of a specific species, you have to put your money where your mouth is and not just say you should do something. Actually do it. Now, when I've got about five minutes, and I think I've taught you guys this already, to convince someone why we need to save a certain area of the planet, like the rainforest, I talk about biodiversity. Why do we care about saving biodiversity? The quick and short answer is that we need to save plants because they got the medicines, and the medicines are what fix us, right? Y'all, the first antivirals, and obviously antivirals are being, uh, researched at a level unprecedented at the moment. People are working 20 hour days trying to develop new antivirals. There's some people um, at Duke and a couple of people at State and some people at the biotech, some of the biotech companies here in North Carolina really, really working hard that I've talked to some of them. The first antivirals came from corals, you guys. So nature's has the original derivations um, for a lot of our medicines and can help solve our problems, right? You've probably even seen all kinds of other things like uh, this uh, hydroxychloroquine might be useful, although those studies on coronavirus are test tube studies. Once again, they're not in human trials. So hydroxychloroquine, although it is being prescribed along with z -Pax currently, uh, the, the uh, jury's still out on its overall effectiveness towards COVID. But anyways, nature has answers, okay? When you look at endangered species, this is a number has decreased so drastically, they're maybe gonna go extinct. And of course, the reason the creatures are on the verge of extinction has to do with their overall um, environments. And that particular variable is more, has a greater effect in certain environments, right? So like habitat loss, is huge, huge in both terrestrial and freshwater environments. But as far as the ocean goes, over-exploitation is the number one reason we have endangered species, right? And, and that's because we overfish the ocean so drastically, which is kind of ironic now that we're just kind of poisoning ourselves a little bit every time we eat stuff from the ocean, right? Anytime somebody's like, I love sushi, they're basically being like, I love cesium-132, right? Um, you really have to think about these things in terms of their interrelatedness and how all of these things work, okay? Habitat loss, forests, um, and freshwater environments. This is where we get the uh, rainforest destruction and so forth. Yeah, what's interesting though, I will say, is oftentimes I've got a, um, I've got a friend on social media, she actually works for the for Microsoft, and she does. Um, she ha I think she's the head of their sustainability offices, so she's constantly guilt tripping people on the internet, right, about what they should and should not do, uh, rather than trying to empower them, which I always find frustrating. And 
I, I usually fact check her and lay out a bunch of um, data in an effort to uh, try and get her to be more uh, transparent with her information. But in any case, uh, one of the things she was trying to guilt people about the other day was meat consumption, which of course is disastrous in, turn, in, in, in a lot of in in a lot of different ways. It is disastrous. Uh, not just CO2 output, but we've seen how impossible it is to offset our CO2 output. We, uh, that every little, every person can make a difference thing is not a significant argument when it comes to CO2 sequestration. You can make that argument for conservation in general for sure, because we can make huge impacts at the local and regional level. But um, she was saying that people need to stop eating meat to save the rainforest. Well, guess what? I've got some bad news for you. It turns out that less than 1% of American imports are from Brazil, and 90% of that 1% are in the form of metal. It was illegal for us to import meat from Brazil for like the last five years. Now, with the, of course, as you might imagine, with the um, new administration, the Trump administration has become more lenient and allowed, began to allow the import of meat from Brazil. But we get such a tiny portion of our meat from Brazil it's negligible. What we get from Brazil? Coffee, fruit, vegetables. If you want to reduce your impact on the Brazilian rainforest destruction, then from a statistically significant standpoint, it's in terms of coffee. Make sure you're not getting coffee from Brazil. Well, that gets tricky, doesn't it? So, just like to, it, everything is very specific. If you're trying to be intentional with your conservation efforts, you need to be very specific and not run around um, guilt tripping people over things you don't understand or you have not well researched, right? Just like we saw with that CO2 sequestration. So we do all kinds of things to destroy their habitat. Of course, we burn down the forests, we log them, we have grazing livestock, so we cut the forest down, which is a huge problem in Brazil. Most of that meat, however, from the rainforest destruction goes towards China. Now, I will say, however, if you're eating peanut butter that isn't raw peanut butter, the stuff that separates into oil and so forth, what they use as a stabilizing agent in peanut butter is palm oil, and palm oil comes from the production of palm trees that are grown through mainly habitat destruction in the rainforest. So eating peanut butter that has palm oil is disastrous for the rainforest, right? For example, the reason people want to conserve the rainforest so much, you guys, is because that, that, high, that high level of net primary productivity and that high level of biodiversity. That's why people are so concerned with that which you probably know, okay? We also steal minerals. Um, a lot of those minerals go to uh, parts in our phones. And this thing, right? Parts in our phones. And of course, we build houses and roads everywhere. We've got about 13% of land in conservation, although, once again, Trump administration has... It loosened a lot of the regulations around the national and state level parks and um, has lead to increasing development in those areas. We have a huge amount of protected land in the U.S., by the way, you guys, thanks to, um, I believe, the Reagan administration that, that started making uh, a lot of laws that instituted the national park system, um, or at least increased their stringency. So we have a ton of uh, protected areas. Doesn't look like so much here in North Carolina, but like I said, we've got that high degree of biodiversity. Much of it is out west. Y'all, Washington State has more um, national parks than anywhere else in the U.S. Uh, I, I threw whaling in concert, into this conservation um, presentation because somebody asked me about it once. Well, what about whaling? Well, whaling also disastrous. Uh, in, in terms of removing huge key players in, tro in, in the trophic cascade of ocean environments. And of course, we used to harvest whales for their oil, which we used to use for lamps. And huge crews used to go out and kill whales. Well, guess what? Whaling is still legal in Japan. So, disastrous. Um, narwhals, 
which are allowed to be hunted by um, Arctic uh, endemic peoples. And uh, they have, they have, I can't remember their limit. They do have a limit for them. Um, but this also obviously influences narwhal numbers. Although usually I think it's in a sustainable harvest way. Beautiful, beautiful whales. Belugas. Y'all, if you've never been to Atlanta, you got to go see the beluga whales. If we look at North Carolina, there used to be huge long stands of longleaf pines. Huge, large stands of longleaf pines. Y'all, these pine needles, we're talking uh, 18 inches long. So cool. Now there's huge stands of longleaf pines in... Uh... I keep shaking this phone. I'm sorry. I'm going to make y'all nauseous. Uh, there's huge stands of longleaf pine down in Florida and Georgia where they're trying to reestablish uh, this particular species. But North Carolina was largely over harvested to make turpentine and so forth. But we had huge stands of pine savanna. Uh, you guys have got to look up pictures of longleaf pines. Type in longleaf pine um, grass stage. They look like some Dr. Seuss character trees. I love them. Um, of course, we are one of the only places where we have native uh, Venus flytraps. I think we are the only state. Um, in us, North Carolina and South Carolina, we have the only states, the Carolinas, where we have native uh, predatory Venus flytraps. I wish they were bigger. They're little. Be cooler. Like I mentioned, those flying squirrels. The red wolf, which is the saddest story in conservation ever because we have the only remaining population of red wolves in the United States on the planet, and they about to go extinct, y'all. We got the, the, there's only three breeding pairs left. Um, early 2015, I think I looked up numbers. They have not done a good job collecting data in the last four or five years. I've contacted and called our governor to try and institute something or get them to address this further, and they tell me they're looking into it. And there's been a couple memorandums, but as far as reestablishing a conservation effort there, most of these guys are on private land and have been mistaken with coyotes, uh, so farmers and so forth trying to provide for their families. you got to remember, right, the double-edged sword about all of this is that we judge people for burning down the forest in Madagascar, for clear-cutting the forest, um, for cattle in the rainforest, but these people oftentimes are just trying to feed their families, right? They're not thinking in terms of global climate change like we do. We've got tons of cool native species. That's Schweinz's sunflower in the bottom right. Only place that that flower grows. <laughs> You're like, well, yeah, it looks like a sunflower. There are interesting and unique differences in the flower morphology of that sunflower. Only place we find that sunflower, within 30 miles of Charlotte, North Carolina, on the planet. Sturgeon, gray bats, all kinds of cool stuff. So, how can you make a difference? Put a bell on your cat, right? This is a hilarious map I like of uh, the feral cat population in Australia. <laughs> Look how big they get. Those things are crazy, right? I've mentioned before, there's a huge feral cat population. We all love our kitties, and I love mine. I keep bells on all mine because it breaks my heart when they try to murder some of the creatures in my garden. Um, I love cats. I think a lot of people love cats. I love dogs, too. But cats are mean, mean little murder machines, right? So put a giant bell on their forehead and keep them from hurting creatures as much. Um... The only thing that hunts wild cats in Australia, dingoes. Get them dingoes. Also, <laughs> elsewhere in the world where there's feral populations, I don't think there's a large population of them left anymore, but the harpy eagles will also eat them more rarely. We, of course, have... Uh, oh, this is just the cat-relatedness. We've learned about this. One thing I wanted to point out is that... <laughs> Y'all, this is imprinting in panda researchers. If you heard during the coronavirus stuff that there was a mating pair of pandas that they haven't, that they've been trying to get to mate for over a decade and they finally did it now that uh, there's no one at the zoo, of course, because geez, they just wanted some alone time, right? But I love these super creepy pictures I found on old Nat Geo where where these researchers use panda suits to imprint on pandas. And I don't know what's creepier. Um, the guys in the suits or uh, the guys in these suits. <laughs> they were like, these suits are not panda-like enough. These, 
we've got to get real panda suits. And of course, this is my uh, <laughs> favorite one. <laughs> Where uh, this guy's like, um, dude, this is some creepy serial killer stuff, right? Uh, <laughs> this is <laughs> all from the same ep uh the same article in that geo. This is my favorite panda photo of all time. I don't know if that's photoshopped or real, but this looks like something that would be in the centerfold of some uh, calendar magazine. Love it. Conservation is really tricky, even when we look at an animal level. Uh, basically, it's conservation triage. Usually, once or twice a year, a bunch of conservation biologists get together at these huge um, expos and conferences, and they do conservation triage, where they have to figure out which creatures need they need to push for legislature for protection for. Um, and it could be at regional levels, it can be at the national level. And they basically look at what's more important, you know, the function of that particular species, whether or not it represents evolutionarily some unique phylogenetic representative of that particular species, whether or not it's in a biodiversity hotspot and we need to preserve that area of land. These are all really important factors that we factor in, okay? Um, red pandas, I can't remember why I brought up red pandas. Oh, just I think because people think that they're more related to pandas than they are not, but they're more closely related to raccoons, y'all. Lots of biodiversity hotspots, usually in equatorial regions. Flagship species I mentioned before. My goodness, if you show anybody a baby version of any creature, like a polar bear, here's your little black bear. Black bears are usually very, very harmless, super sweet guys. They live all up in the mountains of North Carolina. I don't believe there's ever been an attack that has resulted in mortality maybe once in the history, documented history of bear attacks, little baby owlets, my God. Um, oh, this is just some data on global climate change with, the, uh, with NASA that you don't have to watch. In class, I would have you guys brainstorm conservation efforts. Some of my top ones, buy responsibly sourced products. If you're thinking about buying something, think about it. Oh. Hold on, what did I do? Okay, sorry. If you're thinking about buying something, think about it. Buy responsibly sourced clothing, right? Think about it. It doesn't have to be Patagucci, right? But it has to be something you're going to think about. How long is it going to last you? How much are you going to put into that? What efforts does that company take to minimize its impact? Is it a significant effort? Is it just for marketing, right? Is it biodegradable? Y'all, I just wrote an article not too long ago for one of the, the blogs that I write for about uh, biodegradable shoes, right? Are there biodegradable shoes? Yeah. Oh, there's a couple. There's wooden Dutch shoes, right? There's some grass sandals that you can order from parts of Asia that are fully biodegradable. But if you can buy something that's biodegradable, y'all, wood, um, bowl, wood, cup, whatever, then you can control its production. Then you can control its um, end, end of life input, right? I was going to say, if you can control production too, right? If you can make yourself a pair of grass sandals, if you can control production and end of life, then you fully control the energy input and output of that particular product. Of course, that's highly unrealistic most of the time, but still an interesting way to think about. Minimizing paper use, of course, obviously. Um, eating less meat can be important if you know what you're doing right where did what are the farming practices of the particular meat source that you're consuming um as i mentioned before we don't consume much brazilian meat so don't think you're saving the rainforest by decreasing that meat consumption you are decreasing your carbon output for sure in a significant way in terms of us growing things to offset it maybe not but you can look at sustainable farming efforts for yourself. Palm oil, disastrous, right? Hard when peanut butter is the main product that contains it. Exotic wood purchasing. One day, if you get wealthy and you can buy some mahogany wood to put in your house, right? Not a good idea. Buy a bidet, not joking, right? Also, kind of hilarious. I've got one now. Um, I've had one my whole life. My mom was always super into bidets. I think it's a Bermudian thing, right? But y'all, if you're wiping 
your butt with the rainforest or with the forest, how much of an effort are you really making in conservation in general, right? People will be like, you don't drink K-cups, do you? And I'll be like, do you use toilet paper? Buy a bidet, right? They're awesome. <laughs> this would be way weirder if we were together in person. Uh, you can feed the birds around your house, of course, putting your money where your mouth is. If you have a particular conservation effort you're actually concerned with, fuel it, right? Those four ocean bracelets, amazing. You purchase a bracelet, it goes to directly pay people who are directly fish and trash directly out of the ocean or rivers, right? Significant impacts. All right, hold on. I'm trying to not move this around too much. Okay. By native plants, extremely, extremely important. Of course, if you're curious about these things, you can contact me later on down the road. You can join the gardening club, which I, I head up. Um, we do all kinds of things. Probably the single easiest way for you to make a significant impact at the local level on biodiversity and conservation is growing plants, right? Of course, creek restoration cleanups are great. Um, Hold businesses accountable. Habitat restoration, really, really important. This is getting ready to be done for Toby Creek. The county takes care of this. And of course, we will make uh, great efforts to assist with that. Wildlife corridor, super useful. Stop eating weird things, right? This is what got us in this trouble to begin with. Um, yeah, don't eat bats, right? Some creatures have been domesticated for tens of thousands of years. Some of them fly around. Um, what else we got? Invasive species, disastrous, right? We've got kudzu. Um, <laughs> we do our best to try and offset these things. This is one of these things where scaling is a huge issue. We can't really help with this. Um, if you're a psychopath like me, you can try to remove them manually. I walk around Reedy Creek with a pair of <laughs> of trimmers and I cut down invasive species. I'm making a local impact. Overall, can you deal with a, this is an empress, this is a princess tree, sorry. Um, Albizia, it's typically referred to, or also the mimosa tree. These are the seed pods it sets. I mean, we're talking 10,000 seeds. Am I gonna offset those things? No way, but I'm gonna make a go at it, right? That way, those little seedlings are not influencing native species. Why are native species better? Because they thrive in the environments that they evolved in. The southeast heat and high humidity, native species thrive better. Woolly aphids, disastrous, all kinds of things. Um, we'll talk about more specifics of these creatures in the future. These are tent moths. These things are disastrous. They build those cocoons that you see that are gross everywhere. What can you do? Eliminate them. Pick them up. Squish them if they're invasive. Uh, growing a diverse range of plants. Once again, I said having a garden, probably the most beneficial thing you can do in the future. Oh, look at that. God, look how smudgy my laptop is. Hey, friends. All right, guys. Well, this is it. Hopefully, I'll see y'all in the fall semester. I've got to write your final exam at some point. Um, I'll open up your homework for this. I wasn't holding the phone this whole time, by the way. I used a stand, but then something happened. <laughs> so, anyways, I'll open up your last little bit of homework. I'll start working on your final exam. I hope you guys are doing okay. Stay positive. Um, take deep breaths. Don't be too hard on yourself because none of those things will help you in the end anyways. All right, friends.